Now we have Kristen who is going to be talking about diving into Mac Mile analysis for the first time. Uh, Kristen is a world-renowned keynote speaker. <laughs> and so let's give a round of applause for Kristen. Nice to be here, not world-renowned keynote speaker, but thank you, Patrick. Um, so the idea for this talk today was essentially, let me be a guinea pig who knows absolutely nothing about Mac malware and record my experience trying to dive into it and like, how do you reverse it, understand it, analyze it, what do you get out of it? Um, and I know having you know only kind of been technical for the last like five, six years that if you don't know what you don't even know about something, it can be a little bit intimidating trying to understand like where do you start um, and so I had never looked at Mac malware specifically I have a history with some malware analysis but this was new so I was like okay let's just you know see what mistakes I make what resources we can use the time commitments everything um, and kind of what I want to dive in on all of this is you can work smart not hard and still get a lot of high level like a lot of good information from like very high level surface investigations um, and we have 25 minutes you're not going to be like a top reverse engineer in 25 minutes after this but I'm hoping that I can get enough information across where it's useful for a range of people from like sales engineers to incident responders to if you're researchers threat analysts who go a bit more in the weeds um, there's not there's a lot you can learn from this. So a little bit about me, like I said, um, I don't have Mac malware history, but I used to work at Lookout, so I did focus on Android surveillance where um, Android malware analysis, and I was on the threat intelligence team, so tracking those actors, uh, and now I work at Sophos and Product for incident response and threat intelligence. But how we're gonna structure this talk, I wanna just go into some key concepts for malware analysis in general, um, you know, not just Mac related, some common questions that you'll run into when you're analyzing things. And it's kind of like a running mental checklist to keep in your head when you're looking at malware to just structure your investigation. Um, and then say, taking those base concepts and the basic analysis methods and how you find those and applying it to Mac. So like, what does Mac malware look like? How do you dive in? What are some challenges you might come across? Um, and then at the end, just general resources, tooling, like time commitments. We're all busy, full-time jobs, students, whatever. You know, how much time does it actually take to kind of learn this skill set? So key concepts. If you're trying to analyze malware or any type of malware in general, uh, what are some things you have to know? And it can get a little frustrating because you have all these available tutorials that say like, you know, go, just dive in, um, you're analyzing, you're doing X, Y, and Z, all these things. But unless you actually know what you're trying to get out of it, you can end up down all these different rabbit holes that make things way too complex. Maybe you're looking at code that is frustrating you and actually in the end has nothing to do with what you actually wanted to know. Um, or like the resources you're reading, like you're like, yes, I get you know, conceptually what you're saying, but I'm not sure how to apply it. Um, so make sure you know what your end goals are there. Like, are you working in incident response? And maybe you have uh, you know, indicators saying that there's this one file that's the cause of this issue, and you just wanna know quickly, like, what is it, did it spread, how do I get it off? Like, that's something. Or maybe you're on threat intelligence where you're gonna dive maybe a little more into the code, but you're trying to figure out not only what it can do, but you know, what infrastructure is it talking to? Like, do we know anything about it? Can we trace that infrastructure to a specific threat actor or like, you know, a different adversary? Or have we been following this code for a while and, you know, we've seen how it's evolving over the years and they're implementing new functionalities. They, they know people are analyzing the code. They're trying to like hide the new functionalities or change up their infrastructure. Um, so from the start, I think you should define like what you're trying to get out of it. Like, are you gonna be in the weeds and doing this big technical write-up or you just wanna know, bad, get it off. This is what we're doing. Um, and so that said, to define your goals, these are just some of the common questions that I think you should keep in mind. Um, you know, infection vector, how did it get on there in the first place? Are there gonna be any indicators in the malware that, you know, a user willingly downloaded it? Was it in an app store? Was it, you know, do you need physical device access and someone has to plug a USB in to install this malware? Um, capabilities, like what is it doing? Is it, you know, financially motivated? Is it surveillance where? Um, is it good at it? You know, is it trying to hide? Like, is it looking for antivirus before it installs? Um, you know, how smart is it? Um, and then also persistence, you know, it might be on there, but it's, you know, is it gonna run every time a user logs in? Is it, you know, does it have a remote delete switch? Is someone gonna delete it eventually so no one can be discovered? How well does it persist? And then, you know, infrastructure and attribution. So if it's exfiltrating data or if it's looking for a second stage or looking for a download, you know, what is that? And then can you also tie that infrastructure to any particular threat actor or persona that you might be following? So that's how I tend to look at things from a threat intelligence side of things and, you know, to each their own and what they're trying to do out of this. Um, but that's kind of how I will, my, the questions I keep in the back of my head when I'm going through it. And then when you're doing analysis, you have two different methods. You have static and dynamic analysis. 
So static analysis, it's really just, you know, you're not running the file, you're just looking at it, and this can be really high level. Um, you know, I can read some scripts that they have installed, you know, I can access it through the command line, or you can take the binary and look at it in a disassembler, you're getting into assembly code, or you can have dynamic analysis where you set up a proper analysis environment, um, you know, and you're actively running the malware. Either you have a burner device or, you know, you're on an emulator running it, but you can capture, you know, the network traffic, what's it talking to, you can see live what it's doing. Um, but again, in 25 minutes, how do you like get the most out of this? We're not gonna do dynamic analysis really or like in the binary stuff, but just working smarter, like how can you get at an entry level good information out of malware? So if we've defined our goal, we can theoretically do that. So in terms of setting up your environment, I was debating how much time to spend on this, but I actually have run into more people who actually ran into the problems I did as well, so I don't feel as stupid about this. But setting up an analysis environment you know, you set up a VM, everyone's like, great, fine and dandy, but one of the problems I ran into is I have now an M1 Mac, I used to have an x86 Mac, and so I was trying to install a VM for an M1, and that just, it took me like eight hours to figure this out, and I will say that so no one else feels silly if they're trying to set up an environment. But, um, so what was happening, you know, there's VMware, VirtualBox, Parallels, yay, Parallels, we love Parallels, um, but what happened was I was trying to set it up, and I, you know, I'd used VMware before, so I was like, let's try and do that. There's forum talk of like, they can run it on an M1, I was trying. Um, I couldn't pull the ISO from my application folder, which is supposedly where you could, so I was like, all right, let's, you know, convert the Monterey installer into an ISO file, and then try and then set it up. But apparently, VMware only goes up to like V11, and Monterey is a 12, so next step. Okay, what could I do since that didn't work? I was like, well, let me try and get an older version of Mac, because then I could set up a VM that way. And that led me to find out a bit about like the invisible guide rails that Mac kind of has in place for user security. Like on the new M1s, like I have a 2020 and a 2021 Pro and Mac and MacBook Air. And I wasn't able to download any of the older versions, whereas my coworker who had an old Mac was like, I can download these fine from the Apple store. So, because my next option there would have been like to create an older VM. But that got me thinking about just kind of basic security controls, and Mac and Apple have really set up a system, which I call, like, they define it, they want explicit user interaction, like, there's a reason they're upgrading things, they don't want you downgrading to an older system, they found bugs, they found security issues, they're patching, they're fixing it, so they would naturally make it very hard for you to install older versions that have problems, um, which is good, but also in this, like, research perspective, it was getting a little bit frustrating, um, so, but I think that's important to note, because you have these invisible guardrails, where you know file quarantine will tell a user like you have to specifically say you downloaded this from the internet like do you want to open this or a gatekeeper will check um, code signing information and if there's not a valid ID like it won't run it they have a lot of malware mitigation like built in which is very useful compared to like you know when I used to do Android stuff there's a billion third party app stores you know you can have falsified signers like there's it's a lot harder to control. Um, but so I think that's something to keep in mind because when you're looking at Mac malware, if you flip it on its head of how an adversary is gonna think about creating this malware, they have to deal with this ecosystem of getting a user to either click and accept and give permissions or to how do they get it to download? What you know infection vector can they go through if it's not gonna make it into the official Apple store, which rarely, sometimes they will, but like it's a lot harder. So just kind of thinking on it that way, that was good to know. But then check number two, after like hour 10, my friend goes, try parallels. And I highly, highly recommend Parallels VM because it truly was like two clicks, VM up and running in like two minutes. So if you have an M1 or if you're just looking for something easier, I'm not pitching them, but like it worked. They have a 14 day free trial and then it's like a hundred bucks. So uh, what does Mac malware actually look like? When you open it up, um, you have some basic folders that you'll typically inside of it. So in the contents folder, you have your code signature, your info.plist, uh, your resources, and a Mac OS folder. Um, and I kind of divide these files into two types. So you have like binary and non-binary files. And I know everything technically is like a binary file, but by binary file in Mac OS, I mean like stuff that's not easily human readable, like it's an assembly, you're gonna put it in Ida, Ghidra, something like that to deal with it, versus the top three, they're very easily read. They're like scripts, um, you can read them in the command line, in a text editor, something like that. Um, and so code signature, if this file is there, it means it was signed by a developer. Um, so it's always interesting to look into. You can see who made it. Maybe it's a persona of someone you're gonna be tracking. Maybe you can then use that to pivot off of to see who else is like tied to this malware. Um, you can create detection rules around information in there. Um, you have info.plist. 
plist is a property list, um, and so it's very important because when you launch Mac malware, it has all metadata about apps stored in key value pairs. So it specifies, um, it specifies different attributes of the app that um, you know, can talk about the application's capabilities, like what it can do, another thing we're looking for. Um, and a lot of times malware authors will also target plist and the info plist because if they modify the key value pairs, um, they can influence system behaviors. So pay attention to this if anything odd stands out in there, as we'll get into in a bit, like that's a good place to start. Um, and then the resources folder, this is really just kind of like anything else that is in there. So it could be scripts, executables, other files, whatnot. Um, and then the Mac OS file. Um, and I've never said this out loud. I think it's pronounced Mac O, Mac O, the, format, the file format, um, M-A-C-H dash O. Um, so that's also where the malware will be, but I've only read it and never actually said it until now. But so looking at just like an example of a file that I downloaded. I got this hash, uh, you can download it from Virus Total. it's on the Objective-C website. It was a recommended file to look at for analysis on a Sentinel-1 tutorial for like looking into Mac malware. Um, and so you can see in there, you have, if you break it down, you have your contents folder, code signature, Mac OS, uh, with the unpack NW, which is the malware. And then, you know, you, in your resources folder, you have unpack.txt and package information and a plist. So going through at a higher level, just like useful information, starting again, before you open IDA or anything, what can you get out of the stuff that you have in front of you? So for signing information, um, and on the side, I'm gonna leave in some tips about just different uh, command line tools that you can use when you're analyzing these things. But so, code sign. Um, you instantly get information off the bat of you know, bundle identifier, team identifier. You can use those to create detection rules. You might see something up there like developer application, techie util software. If you're doing an OSINT investigation, maybe start digging in, find out who's behind that there. Um, and then you also have something called SBCTL, where if you put it in, um, you can see if the certificate from the signer was revoked or not. And so we mentioned, you know, gatekeeper is gonna be checking if there is signing information. It will try and, you know, block applications that don't have a valid ID or if something's been revoked, it's not gonna run. So it's been revoked, so either it's not gonna run or maybe the malware author has, like, a workaround to try and get this going. And then you have your plist, um, so your property list with, like, key value pairs here. Um, it'll highlight a lot of different things, um, maybe like the minimum software version that the malware is gonna run on, which can also be good for actor tracking of you know, you know maybe what type of devices they're going after. Um, but it also has settings as to how the malware itself is gonna run. So the one at the bottom that I highlighted, LSUI element, this is an interesting thing to look at because if it's set to one, that means the application is gonna hide itself in the dock, which instantly is like a little bit suspicious. If I'm a valid you know, application, why do I need to hide myself? Um, and so in terms, again, of like checklist of things that you're looking for, same with Android malware. If I was focusing on surveillance where I'm interested in things that you know, read your text, activate your camera, your geolocation, hides its icon. So same for malware, you know, I'll instantly add this to like my checklist of like if this element is set to one, that's a red flag and maybe I should keep digging because it's hiding itself. Um, and also, they can alter this file to improve their persistence, um, and we'll get into some specific examples later, but basically, some different types of malware will add key value pairs to the list um, to, you know, restart every time a user logs in. Um, and so, definitely, if you see a plist, like, look at it in malware, or in Mac malware analysis. And then for resources, this is gonna vary depending on whatever malware that you're looking at. This sample in particular had a few things in it. Um, I like to start with LSLA. Any hidden files, if something is like a dot whatever hidden, sometimes people hide it that way, that'll show it. Um, but it has something in there called unpack.txt. And it instantly stands out because it's supposedly a text file, but it has executable permissions. So that doesn't really make sense. Um, and if you use a text editor or cat, um, it'll show up as just like this big jumbled encrypted file, basically. Another indicator that, you know, if it's this jumbled encrypted file that says it's a text file but has executable permissions, Maybe it's worth looking into later. So when you do eventually open up the Mac O file inside, you know, IDA or whatnot, you can see I would look for is something referencing this unpack.txt? Is something gonna decrypt something at some point because I know it's encrypted? So you can kind of already, without knowing exactly what it's doing, you can start placing together the pieces that are gonna be relevant. Um, and then now on to what was in the Mac OS folder, so the Mac O file. So Mac O's, um, they're like an executable but for Mac, um, and so it has, you know, three different pieces, a header, commands, and data, and it comes in different architectures. There's 
universal and single. And universal is also called fat, and I just thought this was funny because the tool you can use to figure out what architectures are inside of it is called lipo, and so someone was like having fun naming this. You can lipo the fat file and you can see what's in it. Um, but so then you have your sequential parts of like what it's made up out of. So your header tells you, you know, what it is, um, and then you have your commands. So when it's dynamically loaded into memory, a good thing to keep in mind here is all these different commands, like it'll be LC underscore and then whatever. LC main is a good place to start because if you dump it into like IDA, you'd be like, where do I start? Like right there is usually where you can begin your analysis. Um, and then it's also broken in the data piece, broken down into underscore text and underscore data. And so I'll give an example of what that looks like because again, before you even have to get into assembly, you can still get a lot of high level information just from these files, like in the terminal. So the data section, or the, so the data section, and we're in underscore text. This has all of the executable functions and methods inside the malware, and a lot of the times actors are sloppy and don't change the names of what the commands can actually do. Um, you know, it'll, if it's saying right there that it says silently fire URL or encrypt, decrypt string, like they haven't changed these names. Like you're not like that annoying author who's labeled everything A, B, C, D, E, so you have no idea what's in it until you go through it. Um, so just off the bat, this gives you like some good strings to look into some capabilities that you think might exist without, you know, actually fully diving in yet. Um, and that brings me to my next tip of like strings analysis. So you can view all of the strings in malware by just like running strings in your terminal, or you can use floss, which is a tool on GitHub, um, and it deobfuscates strings. So that makes it a lot easier too, because sometimes with strings, you'll just get like a jumbled list of strings if the uh, author has like, you know, put in any obfuscation attempts. But basically, there's also some strings you can think of that might be good hunting points. Again, if you're talking about like capabilities and like malicious capabilities, like what it might do, um, so the black on the right, those are just some examples of like what strings look like. And I think of it in two different ways, from strings for capability uncovery as well as strings for uh, coverage creation or you know, better understanding of if other samples exist and who it might be tied to. So for example, from one of these strings, I just put it into virus total and I found that from the one sample I was looking at, there were three other samples that had this exact same really weird unique string. So very likely done by the same developer. And then where you can continue pivoting and expanding is if those other two new samples also had different signers, then you now not only have one hash and one signer, but you have two other hashes with two different signers that you can all tie into being connected to like the same author. So if you're tracking this person, you can see what they're doing, you know, and then if you see what they're masquerading as, is it masquerading as a word download? Is it masquerading as like a books download? You can see and get a better idea of like who they're potentially targeting, how they're trying to get people to install them. Is it Adobe, whatever? Um, so that's one way to look at strings. But then the other way to look at strings, um, there's a few that stand out as like potentially being malicious or indicating suspicious activity. So the file exists at, is it checking if there's an antivirus in play? You know, malware is known to have used this string um, for this API to essentially say, it will use this to check if X antivirus is on this device. And if it is, they don't wanna run. Um, and then you also have authorization execute with privileges. Um, and so we talked again about Apple having these very user-driven interactions where every time you download something, if it hasn't accessed it before, it'll be like, X wants access to your desktop, X wants access to, and you like accept, accept, or like you put in your password how many times if Apple pops something up. Um, this will raise that. So if a user is kind of like not paying attention or fed up with all the Apple security pop-ups, they might inadvertently like give the malware permissions and type in their password and you know, username to give the right permissions so it can escalate through that. Um, and then these last two, you know, ls shared file list create and file list insert item. They can be used to add login items. So uh, another way for malware to gain persistence and ensure that the application will be restarted every time the user logs in. And so again, you can get all of this before even figuring out where it is in the assembly code. If, so I would just say like, maybe look for these things and if they exist, then you start trying to dive down these rabbit holes because you know what might be behind, uh, be behind them. And then uh, the last one again with the P list login items, login and log out hook. You can only have one hook at a time, so sometimes people will add additional commands to an existing login hook or alter them. So, you know, I would just say be aware of like what the hooks are in a plist because it's a common place where people might try and change it to gain persistence. And then you have your other tools. 
So that was very high level, and here's just some information on like pricing and free trials if you wanted to dig into them. But you know, you can do uh, binary analysis, you can do dynamically running things, network analysis. Um, you know, you have your command line, you have some tools with GUIs. Um, the top, the right hand side, you know, you have your disassemblers. I've used Idra and Ida before. Hopper seems to be popular with like analyzing Mac malware. Cutter hadn't really heard of it much, but it was also out there as like a recommended. You know, you can start with. Ghidra, it's free. I got lucky having Ida at my old job. It's very expensive, but you don't need an expensive tool to like dive into this. Um, and then for network monitoring, you know, you have Wireshark, you have Netiquette, which Patrick built. Um, it's built for Mac. It's kind of like a, you know, a Wireshark for Mac. So if you're running something dynamically, it kind of helps save a lot of time. Again, if something is like obfuscated and you don't want to decrypt, you know, what the C2 is, you can just run it and see what it's talking to, or maybe run it and see if it's downloading X file or X update. Um, and then command line tools, again, built by Objective-C and Patrick. You have process monitor and file monitor. Um, and again, it watches for the creation of new processes and the creation of new files, which is important because you can see what's running. And then also sometimes if malware is exfiltrating data, you might make a new file, move stuff to it, zip it, exfil it. So just a good idea to understand if it's like adding or deleting files on your system. And then another tool that is fairly useful, if I first see something and I just want to overview, I'll typically just type in like file in the command line to get a basic understanding of what it is. But Patrick also made this where you can get on Objective-C. Um, it shows you not only the file type in a higher degree of certainty because sometimes file description isn't always right from the command line, but it also shows you signer information. So you can just install it and then on anything, right click, view signing info, and it gives you this nice little GUI pop up. So again, if you're maybe not comfortable with the command line or if you wanted to enable people who are in a more salesy environment to like have an understanding of what things can do, you can just, hey, use this tool um, and it's a nice visualization there. So analysis challenges. Uh, we're not going to get too in depth, but obviously, if you're a malware author, you don't want people figuring out what you're doing and you want to hinder them because you want to make money or you want to steal data, whatever it might be. So they will try and hinder your analysis efforts. Um, and it can really be anything from string encryption or encoding base64. If you see it, fantastic. It's really easy. You just like put it in an online decoder and you can figure it out. But you know, they might also break up their strings so that it doesn't show properly in a disassembler. Um, there's also different packers they can use that really just kind of jumble the contents. And packers are interesting because there is a valid business use to use them sometimes, like if you're developing a software and you don't want anyone reversing it and like making their own profit off of it or you know reversing it for their own gain, you pack it to like hinder that analysis effort. Malware authors will also do the same thing. And so Mac specifically, the ones that I've found so far, IPAC, Muncho, and 1K Pack. So those are some examples there. And then just like resources and time commitments. There's a lot more than I've listed here, but these are the ones that I went through and it's like easily a thousand pages of reading and I've read Patrick's book like three times, but very good insights if you're trying to dive in. But again, like we all have lives and it can be, you know, where do I start? What do I look at first? If you already have a section that you're interested in, go to the table of contents and find it. But otherwise the way that I thought worked best for me was you know, I broke the first book down. It's in three different parts, broken into four days because it gets a little more technical at the end. Then I spent a few days trying to implement what I learned. Then I went through all the footnotes and then I, you know, reread it going through it. Um, but if you're looking to just start, you know, the Sentinel one is really good, small, 39 pages. You can break it into one or two days. It's a good read. Um, lots of other resources out there. And then if you want to truly keep getting like more and more technical, there's, you know, intros to ARM, there's intros to assembly. Um, so you can just dive in that way. But this overall was like, I don't think it was as hard as I thought it would be. Um, and I just don't want people to think that just because you don't know assembly well, you can't get something out of analyzing Mac malware, despite that you know, being where you will do like the full analysis. You can still get a lot just from a high level overview of like what's in it as soon as you unzip the file. So um, I don't know how much time we have left, but I can take questions or that's really kind of my experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? Done. Sweet. Oh, hey. Uh, given, given this is a, a theme of this is an area that's out of much of your previous experience, so what do you think of the resources that are available at the moment, and where do you think the gaps are in the resources that need to sort of fill to make it easier for newcomers? Yeah, so when I started, I knew you could code and I didn't know where it went. I was like, what's a text editor? Like truly like to that level of like, where does the code go? Um, but I think you can, 
there's two different gaps you need to bridge there. There's bridging the gap between a basic understanding of like, these are all the tools you should basically install in your system to understand what will get done, like Vim or you know just Sublime Text, something like that. Um, and then I think also then breaking it down mostly into, if you know what exists, we'll just do a high level there, but then I think really taking the time. I feel like a lot of times people just don't put in the effort to say like, I've made all these mistakes, like they'll put out great tutorials and you know they are easy to follow along, but like I've been in security for six years and I will willing, I'll say it took me like 10 hours to set up a VM on an M1 and like that's fine, but no one wants to say that out loud. So I think just kind of you know bridging the gap of like there should be a way to say here's what we work in, here's what we work with and here's what we're working towards. You could split it up that way. Um, but there's a lot of good free tutorials where I think if you go to the authors of them, they will take the time to like help you understand what you're missing there, but just people being honest about, you know, where to start. <laughs> yeah. Super helpful for introductory stuff. So imagine, you know, someone's gone through this, now they have a pretty good foothold. Where would you tell them to go next and, and how to do that? Is that um, writing their own diving into specific topics and if it's that, what topics? Kind of just yeah. If you gave this talk tomorrow and it was like part two, just give people a sense of what you would recommend. It's like, again, like what are you doing? Are you responding to an incident where you wanted to know how bad this malware was or what did it do, did it spread? That's one level versus I miss my old job, which I consider just like the pure joy of academic research and getting nosy and digging into infrastructure and like you accidentally left your LinkedIn profile up and I found out who you were and like pivoting to the full extent of malware capabilities to ownership and authorship and who that actor was. Um, do what, if you're not doing it for work, like what areas interest you the most? Like again, I like being nosy and I'm more interested in like the OSINT side of things. So I wanna know what the malware can do, but then I'm more interested in like, did you leave behind comments that you, you know, or did you comment something out in the code that made it through that could tell me who you were? Or is your infrastructure like your personal blog web page and you can figure that out? So um, again, I think it just all depends what you're trying to do, but um, yeah, just keep digging in, like learn assembly. I hate it, it's, I'm not good at it, but like I'll say that too. It's a pain, but there's a lot of good tutorials. Um, Amanda Rousseau went through one once and I felt like I learned it after she gave it, then I forgot it a week later. So like it's possible, there's tutorials out there, but yeah. use it as a crutch for me not wanting to go into a disassembler because I'm like, oh, I can find out so much stuff without having to do that. Um, again, in terms of biases, yes, I tend to want to see like surveillance where, wherever it is there, but it's not always, I, I think, looking at adware is boring. I don't really care about, you know, crypto stuff is interesting. It's, you know, ransomware that's interesting, but like I personally find the surveillance piece more interesting. Um, so to each their own, I guess, but I would say, yeah, maybe, Again, this was a cursory investigation and spent only a few months kind of like digging into this, so maybe as I do it more, I could give you a better answer to what I think I'm avoiding. But for now, maybe it's just, I wouldn't want to look at malware that only was like pop-up ads. Like, that doesn't interest me. So, maybe that. Yeah. Um, I think identifying what I want to find. I've looked through enough stuff and gone through enough thread until that I know what needs to be interesting. Or if I were to talk to someone who had a different mindset, I said, well, if you're interested in, you know, learning more about financial gains malware, I can still identify like these are the key components that might be of interest to dig into. So yes, well, I might be more interested in the espionage side and I can break down, you know, this is what I want to find. Um, I think that ability to like understand what your problem is and what the broader categories are to solve it are, and then weaknesses would still be learning in Mac specifically. Um, what strings or what APIs do I look into to potentially find X capability? I'm still very new to it, so again, I think the biggest thing is at the outset, if you are able to define what you're trying to get out of this, is it making a report, is it just a quick answer, um, that's very useful.